A college football expert projected Robbie Ashford to be Albert's starting quarterback next season. Freezing temperatures are likely for several hours inland and a few hours closer to the coast. Yes. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Join me as he does every single Monday. The everydayers know him, Lindsey Crosby of AuburnDaily.com, as well as a million other outlets, it seems. But Lindsey, one of my favorite outlets every single year is Phil Steele. He writes his annual college football preseason preview magazine. It's incredible. Uh, just the amount of information that's in there. And folks that pre-ordered it got the digital copy over the weekend. Hmm. And he put out he puts out a depth chart for every player or every team, and every player is on there. It's it's, it's a lot of information, but. He has Robbie Ashford as Auburn's starting quarterback, starting over Peyton Thorne. And the reason every time, anytime he does something like this where it carries some weight is he talks to all of his head coaches in preparation for this magazine. And so I just wonder what he was told by Coach Freeze and what he's seen on tape and just kind of the logic of, having a guy and going out and getting another guy. Like I, I, I want to know, I want to know what, wh- how could he possibly have uh Peyton Thorne as a backup right now? If you're just having to guess what Auburn's depth chart looks like. I'm going to speculate a couple things. I think the first one is because it is for a print magazine, right? We don't know the timing of when this was done. Maybe this was something where he talked to, I mean, maybe he talked to Hugh Freeze, like during spring or right after spring practice. And it was something where Peyton Thorne wasn't necessarily here yet, or they didn't know for a fact that he was going to be, the, like, you know, maybe it was just a timing thing. So maybe, maybe that was it still feels a little odd to like know well, that they're going after guys. in the. Portal. I have, I have a guess when it was actually okay. because the North Texas guys, both of them committed the same day, Jair shorter and Larry Nixon. They're both on here. Shane hooks is not. So I think it's between those two announcement dates. So late in the portal period is my guess. No, Shane Hooks is on there. He's I just him. second string behind Cam Brown, which is, as a senior, it's like, wait a second. That's kind of odd. Looking then it on should there, be updated then. I mean, that's everybody for the most part. It's everybody, I think, minus the defensive back that committed just recently. Other yeah, than like him, last I, week, right? Yeah, I, everybody else is on there. So, so it's, it's not the timing. And so maybe this is something where Hugh Freeze is trying to make sure that like, okay, you don't, you, you don't have the starting job yet, Peyton Thorne. You, and, and we trust you on this, but you got to come in here. You have to do the work over the summer and the fall to become the starter. He's the incumbent. So he's going to be the starter uh, w- when I talk to Phil Steele, but there's still time between now and the season. Yeah, I, I was just surprised by that but everything else seems pretty straightforward i I think there's a few position battles where i'd kind of go the other way but running backs look like they're in the right order he has batty ahead of austin but does have jarquez as the starter there the starting receivers were javarius johnson camden brown and jair shorter that sounds right to me um that wouldn't surprise me uh, Rivaldo Fairweather is a starter than the offensive line is what we think it's going to be. Uh, so, I mean, nothing really surprising on the offensive side of it. And on the defensive side, Lindsey, Marcus Harris, Justin Rogers, Jason Jones. He has Keldrick Falk as a starting Jack. Like, okay, that wouldn't surprise anybody. I think it'll be Elijah McAllister when it's all said and done, but still, like, they're both going to play a similar amount, I would guess. Yeah. And then he has Cam Riley and Austin Keys as the starting linebackers. Once again, that wouldn't surprise me. That's not what my guess would be. I would definitely guess Keys. Um, I kind of go back and forth on who the other linebacker would be. Larry Nixon's probably a good guess. Cam Riley, I mean, I mean, it makes sense just because of the experience, but that just wouldn't be my my first guess there. And then everything else is what we saw at A Day. Keontae Scott, Nehemiah Pritchett, DJ James, Caden Bridges, and Jalen Simpson. So 
that's kind of that all of that makes sense. Just the, the biggest thing to me is the quarterback situation. And so he's just kind of hope he's just kind of guessing that Robbie will hold on to his job. Yeah. And, and kind of, kind of gaming this out. What is, if Robbie Ashford does hold on to the job, yeah. what does that mean? I guess one for Peyton Thorne, but what does that mean for Auburn's offense? If Robbie Ashford is the starter, are we assuming he become he remains the starter because he's made a logical improvement in accuracy and decision making and things like that? And if it and if that's the case, what does Auburn's offense look like? What is the ceiling on Auburn's offense if you have a SEC an average SEC quarterback in Robbie Ashford? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's two ways you could take that, Lindsay, right? I think some people will kind of trot out and say, oh, Peyton Thorne didn't translate from Michigan State to Auburn. He's a bust, right? That's I think that's what one narrative would be. The other narrative, and it's the one I'm going to choose to answer this question with because I'm going to give both of these players the benefit of the doubt, is Robbie won the job. And Robbie worked on those things that this coaching staff asked him to work on, which is great. And, and we talked about this, uh, I think it was with Mike G on Friday. Where it's like if Robbie wins the job, you could really chalk it up as a good thing for Auburn because I think Peyton Thorne is going to be Peyton Thorne. Like I think we know what he is. He's played enough college football for it to translate from Michigan State to Auburn. So if Robbie Ashford does win the job, you've got to assume he's put all this together. And it's like, man, if you talk about the upside with you know, his, his feet and maybe he figured out the leadership aspect of all of this, I think it'd be huge for Auburn. But Lindsay, I just want to clarify, I do not think Robbie Ashford will win the starting job. But if he does, if he does, I, I think it'll be in a way where this scheme and this offense would help elevate him. I think he would look different in this offense than he did in Brian Harson's offense a year ago. Yeah, and I think part of that's just going to be protection. I mean, if nothing else, it feels like some of the issues he had last year was because he was rushing everything because yes. the protection was not there. To. So, yeah, right. so I think just just average league average protection, he's going to be better than a 49% passer. But if he puts it all together, it feels, and I'm not, people who listen to my show and I talk about baseball stuff, we don't do comps. I don't compare players to players and I don't do that because it gives people unrealistic expectations. But I see the potential in Robbie Ashford to be a dynamic dual threat quarterback in the same th way that I think about a guy like a Nick Marshall. They're Ooh. different quarterbacks. They're different guys. But thinking about how Nick Marshall could both throw a beautiful deep ball and could juke anybody on the field and thinking about Robbie Ashford, some of the glimpses we've seen, the throw in the Iron Bowl, things like that. It's, it's hard not to imagine. If Ashford wins the job and that's the kind of player that he is, the, Auburn could be in for a very good season. But again, kind of like you, I don't think he's going to beat Peyton Thorne. Peyton Thorne, it obviously was chosen to be the guy because they see something in him that they did not yeah. see in the room. So I think it's going to be Thorne. Yeah, and, and, and so many people, and I already can guarantee people are typing in the comments now, it's like Robbie's stuff, like he's a great athlete, you know, he can throw the ball, whatever. Like that's what the comments are. I think the stuff with Robbie isn't on the field. I think it's leadership based off of the field because that, when, when he's asked... When Hugh Freeze has asked questions about him, like he doesn't talk about his ability. He talks about his leadership off the field. And like I don't think he's just saying that to say that. In fact, I think it'd be easier for Freeze to say he's got to work on accuracy, right? Like I think that'd be an easier thing to say than like, yes, he needs to grow up or yes, leadership, right? Because that's what we've heard. And, and I think he's being honest to some extent. Um, and then the other aspect of it is like how healthy can Robbie be? Because even in spring. When they were protected, he still injured his shoulder. So there's just kind of some things about this where it's like, it's not about his play. It's about the other stuff because Lindsay, it all matters. And we've seen Peyton Thorne stay healthy. We've seen Peyton Thorne lead. And just from folks that have talked to Peyton Thorne and folks within the program, when you go in the locker room, it's like, that's the quarterback. He kind of takes over the room, which is what you want your quarterback to do. But Lindsay, after this weekend, I think we can all be very, very confident in one simple thing. Auburn set at quarterback for a long time. We discuss next right here on Locked on Auburn. Today's show brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Lindsay, can you imagine betting on sports anywhere other than FanDuel, America's number one sports book? I would never. 
Yeah, I would never as well. So be sure to head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on. And they've got a no sweat first bet for new customers. If you have never used FanDuel before, go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. And you can bet up to $2,500 with their no sweat first bet. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So you can gamble on anything, whether it's futures with college football, whether it's every night with Major League Baseball. Bet on the Braves right now. They're doing great. Dropped one yesterday. The Nats, they probably shouldn't have. But regardless, they're playing really, really well right now. So be sure to check it all out. FanDuel.com slash locked on. No sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of the NBA. Looking at all the clips that we saw over the weekend, Lindsay, from Auburn's was the elite camp, I believe is what they called it. Mm -hmm. Walker White was there. The 2024 four-star quarterback commit. And it's just hard not to hype this guy up anymore because we've already done it. We all love how he's recruiting this class and he's super, super vocal and really carries himself well. He acts like he's way older than he is. Like There's a lot to like about Walker White. And then you see him trot out and just throw again, you know, throw to these receivers that he has like no chemistry with. I can't throw to them before ever. And it's like his release, Lindsay, it is so clean. It is so clean and effortless. And it's like, man, this guy's got a whole nother year of high school football to play. Like, there's a lot, a lot to love about Walker White. So the exciting thing is we both think Peyton Thorne will start. You get two years of Peyton Thorne, and then you get a true quarterback battle between Hank Brown and Walker White. I think that will happen in two seasons. And there's just a lot to like. And there's a lot of comfort, Lindsay, because like you're looking at four years of like, okay. We're probably going to have solid quarterback play under Hugh Freeze. And that's just something we haven't felt in a long time. Yeah. I mean, it, under the previous coaching staffs, they would bring in transfers, things like that. And there were years when you were like, okay, yeah, we have Jarrett Sidham for another year. Like you had that continuity, but sure. you never had that long term peace of mind that, like, hey, we've got it figured out. We know what's going to happen. Um, and it's kind of looking at all the different scenarios, assuming everybody's healthy. Look at all the different scenarios. It's like, well, if Peyton Thorne has an amazing year and goes pro a year early, you still have really talented guys on campus between Holden Gariner and Hank Brown. Looking at he plays the full two years and then goes to the NFL, which the fact we're even talking about him as like a, yeah, he's going to be an NFL quarterback is a big deal. Love that. But like even like in that case, you've got legitimate between Walker White, who is so dreamy. Kid's so good. Yeah. So dreamy. There's a lot um, to like. There really is. But like you've got that, like you said, you'll have Hank Brown who have been in this offense now for two years. Uh, I'm assuming he'll redshirt this year. And uh, he's what fourth on the chart. So, you know, redshirt this yeah. year, year after is there if you need him. And then legitimate battle as he's a redshirt sophomore with Walker White. And then assuming you have Walker, even if only three years, you're looking at okay, we have five years starting this this year of like yeah you. Like you don't have to worry about buying a jersey because that guy's probably going to be a, an okay player at Auburn. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess he's going to wear number four, which is a good quarterback number. I think not enough quarterbacks wear number four, but that, I think that's sharp. I think it's sharp. I love solid it. quarterback number. Yeah, I love it. And so you know, I mentioned a second ago, and we've mentioned a million times on the show already, but he loves recruiting his class, right? Like that's really really important to him. And so spoke with a lot of receivers, but. Talking to folks close to the situation, Bryce Kane, who is from Mobile, he goes to Baker High School, 5'11", 170. He's a smaller guy, Lindsay. He's a slot player. Um, and he posted a few of his highlights from this weekend. He was here this weekend, posted a few of his highlights on his, uh, his Twitter page. But he can move. Like, he's very, very quick. He's very, very, um, I mean, he just kind of has a good feel for it. But... Evidently, Walker White was all over Bryce Kane all weekend throughout the camp. He just wanted to focus on building a relationship with him, which if he's doing that, you got to assume the staff is telling him to do that, right? Yeah. And so it sounds like with Bryce Kane, it's down to Auburn and Ole Miss, and he should be committing sometime soon is what they're saying. Yeah, those are the, those are the, the two biggest programs, I guess, closest to him. It's like what? 200 miles from Mobile to Auburn, 260 or so to Old Miss. Uh, you think about you have Marcus Davis as this primary recruiter. 
Uh, Zach Etheridge is probably listed in there as a secondary because he usually is for a skill guy, but obviously Walker White's a big deal. And I think for them to come in around the same time or to, to, to be coordinating that together, you have to feel good that they're going to have plenty of opportunities to, to work together, yeah. to build that chemistry. That's the thing. You mentioned it in the last segment. I talk about this all the time. The timing between the quarterback and the wide receiver, how important that is. And when you look Especially at Especially slot guys. Yeah, because the ball's coming out so quickly and they're so much closer to you. Uh, when we look at the roster, it feels like a lot of the skill position talent is upperclassmen, whether it's a transfer like a Hooks, whether it's somebody like a Cam Brown who's probably going to be done and hopefully playing on Sundays by the time that Walker gets here. And so... so I love the idea that he's not here for a little while, but he's already going out and trying to find his guys and building the relationships with them now so that he could come in conceivably and win the job as a true freshman like Bo Nix did and have a successful season because he's already comfortable with the offense, already comfortable with the people he's playing with and doesn't have that hurdle of trying to learn all of that on the fly. I think there's a lot to like about Auburn's situation with quarterback, and I think Peyton Thorne's a good reason why. I think Walker White's a good reason why. And then I put up a special episode with Hank Brown on Saturday. I think that kid's got it, too. So there's just a lot to like about it. But Bryce Kane, I don't know if he's quite on commit watch, but he may be one of the next guys to join Auburn's 2024 class, which is which is great. I think Bryce Kane. And look, Auburn's had success with uh, with three stars from Mobile recently. Roger McCreary, Sean Davis. So we'll certainly see what happens with Bryce Kane. The timing for Walker White also works out for him being here. You know, his third year, he can overlap with a kid from Alabaster. I love your Bush's beans. Uh, he can overlap with the kid from Alabaster named Trent Seaborn. Class of 2027, officially got an offer from Auburn over the weekend. That's Something wild. where, where you know, you can... Thompson's speak, kid, yeah. Yeah. Seaborn can come in, uh, you know, as a freshman, redshirt that one year while Thorne's finishing or while Walker White's finishing his third year. And if Walker White goes to the NFL on Sunday, Seaborn's there with a year of experience in the offense and he can just jump right in and go. And it's, you know, I'm all I'm saying is you could be handled from now through 2030. That's all I'm that, that's all I'm saying. Uh, I, I would take it. I mean, I would yeah. take it in a heartbeat if he's able to do that already. I mean, he's like, what? 13 doing that when you be 13 or 14 doing that like that's remarkable he's so. already six foot 180 won a state title with the varsity as like a 13 year old it's not <laughs> stupid it's it's so crazy. crazy i was Props at that game him. and it was ridiculous it was, yeah i mean it sounded like he was just throwing it all over the place it's wild did not wild. he did not look like a uh a 13 year old he looked like he was at least the age of everybody else if not more so wild to me all right Lindsay auburn had a win over the weekend in regards to the irs the IRS put out a memo, and Auburn is all over it. We'll discuss this in just a moment right here on Locked On Auburn. I want to encourage you to join the Locked On Auburn Discord. It is free. All you have to do is click the link in the episode description down below. Lindsey Crosby, you've come on this show and talked money-related topics often. It's been a minute, but let's jump back into this. So Ross Dellinger with Sports Illustrated over the weekend put out a report saying the IRS put out a memo saying that nonprofit NIL collectives offering tax deductions could be illegal. In a memo today, IRS chief counsel says donations made to 501c3 collectives are not tax exempt because their benefits are not incidental to exempt purposes. So a lot of collectives, and I've seen, I've seen other collectives promote the fact that you can donate to them and it be tax deductible. And I thought, like, that's interesting because I've heard Jason Campbell, who's kind of the, the, the spokesman of Onda Victory, talk about how, like, if you love Auburn, like, you're given to this, and it's like, it's not tax deductible. And I'm like, that's interesting. Why is Auburn set up differently? That seems like a disadvantage. And so after this report came out, I reached out to the folks at Onda Victory, and they're like, yeah, we kind of assumed this memo would come. So we did not apply for the uh, 501c3 status because we saw this coming and we want to do this the right way, which, Lindsay, Hats off to them because I think that probably had to be somewhat of a battle um, as this kind of started because these big donors, right? They're used to get be, they're used to donating to Tigers Unlimited, which is tax deductible. That is set up as a nonprofit. This is not, and so this is going to hurt some programs making this adjustment when Auburn doesn't have to make that adjustment because they've already accounted for it. Yeah. And 
for the folks who are wondering, like, why did they make this ruling? Here's what it boils down to. The argument from the collectives was, if they were even making one, mind you, they registered sure. as a 501c3. Anybody can send in paperwork to do that. I can do that right now. But the argument, if they made one, was this money that you donate is going to help uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds and going to enrich the lives of students and young people. But they just so all happen to be athletes <laughs> of our school. And so the issue is to register. Like, there's a few, but the main one here is to register as a charity. You have to actually do charitable work. And like, that's the big thing is you can't just register and get the benefits without doing the work. And the other part, which folks haven't really talked about this yet, and I find it interesting that it's not come up because the filing deadlines haven't lined up right, but every 501c3 has to fill out what's called a form 990. And in essence, for a nonprofit, it explains this is why we're exempt from income tax. Uh -huh. Here's where most of our money came from. And here's where it went. So that's the other part that even if this memo didn't come out, you how would've... specific do you have to be? Can you just say this went to independent contractors or do you have to say this went to this contractor, this went to this contractor, this went to this contractor? If you don't pay them as employees, you have to disclose a salary of employees. If you don't pay them as employees, you still have to list individual names if they if it is an individual person now if a student athlete set up a business and you paid the business you could get away with slipping that by but if you paid an individual person you had to give their name if it was over a certain threshold and the threshold depends on the size of the nonprofit the way it would have worked most football players you'd have found out what they were making most starters you'd have found out what they were making and so this hasn't really come up for a lot of these 501c3s yet because there's a little bit of grace when you first file it and there's different notification deadlines and things like that. It was going to start being an issue. Probably uh, the end of this fiscal year, you would have seen this come up where it's like, hey, uh, Florida Gators people, we need your, your Form 990. Do you have that? Because any nonprofit's required to give it to you if you ask for it. And um, it would have been really interesting to be like, okay, so that's who's giving you money and that's who you're paying. But Auburn doesn't have to do that because they correctly said, you know what? We're not really doing charitable work here. So we're just going to have it as a private business. We don't have to disclose all of this stuff. And ultimately, I think that was the right move. No question. Yeah. So now there's no adjusting that they have to do. And so we'll see. And according to, you know, Ross Dellinger's report, and I tweeted it out on my, uh, from my page a few days ago when all this was going down, but he makes the, uh, he makes the case like most, most athletic departments are doing it this way. So that like, yeah. props to Auburn for, for seeing ahead of this. I mean, way to go on to victory, which is great. I'm curious to see, just to kind of zoom out a little bit, I'm curious to see what the next step in response to this is. My guess, Lindsay, is, and I think we're a few years away from this anyway, perhaps this speeds it up, but at some point, Athletic departments are going to be able to either govern or inherit or operate collectives tied to their school. I think that's the next step in all of this. Yeah. And we've seen, like, already, we've seen a couple schools, like say, name's a notable example, who have worked to tie the collective to the athletic department's foundation, which is technically separate from the university. Now they obviously they work hand in hand with the athletic department, board of trustees, all of that stuff. It's all, it's all intermingled, but uh, we've seen that be the next step. And that's very much dependent one on state by state, how that's set up. And if you're allowed to do that or not, and I, mm -hmm. I believe if I've read this right, Alabama would require some sort of law to be passed for that to be possible. Uh, but you have that. I do think Tuberville's all over that, by the way. Yeah, he's he's working on it already. He's trying to get that done. <laughs> right. Um, I think in the meantime, like the eventual, like you said, it's eventually going to come from the schools. And the question is going to be, is it going to be, are they going to be on the payroll as employees? Is it going to be similar to an IL, how they're technically independent contractors? When then you get into the classification rules, because there's so many requirements you have on, their time and what they can do 
and a contractor, you can't give them those conditions. The way that everything lines up, and the hard part here is if the government does their job, which never a given, uh, the way everything lines up, they're eventually going to be employees at the university. There's, I just don't see any other way around it. The question is, how long does that take? And yeah. how far does this get until that happens? That's the questionable part. Because we've already seen, like you said, most collectives were 501c3s. And honestly, the disclosures for that are not even worth the hassle of mm -hmm. letting a donor write that off. And if you were the type of donor who was giving as a bag man, for instance, I'm not no, not naming any names, not accusing anybody, just random example. If you were a donor given as a bag man, I don't think you care about the ability to write it off or not. Like it's not, you weren't writing it off when you were a bag man. You're not going to write it off when it goes to the collective because you were already spending that money. You don't care. You're here for but the team to win. But I, I think some boosters are being told, hey, you have been giving X amount of dollars a year to Tigers Unlimited or in, insert whatever athletic program you want to there. Can you give some of that to this? And so I think some of it is they're redirecting funds under the assumption that it would be a tax write-off, and now it's not. And technically, they have the ability, by the, I mean the IRS, they have the ability to go back and remove the tax deduction on those if they decide to actually go into this space. The memo does point out, I read the whole memo before we recorded, the memo does point out that this is not intended to be official guidance from the IRS. This is not the IRS setting a rule about this. This is the deputy counsel expressing an opinion, but it's one that obviously is going to affect how people do things. Uh, the IRS technically has the ability to go back and tax all of those donations retroactively. But I'm assuming their idea here is we can issue the memo and get folks to voluntarily stop so we don't have to jump in and do everything. But know that the IRS could go a lot farther with this if they want to. Yeah, right. Lindsey Crosby, thank you so much for your time. As always, if folks want to support you and check out all the stuff that you've got going on, what is, uh, what's the best way to do that? Sorry, what was the question? I got distracted. Wake Forest hit another home run against Alabama. I'm sorry, what was the question? We've they, always they, been big Demon Deacon guys on this show. Every day or know that. My, uh, my grandfather, starting quarterback for Wake Forest. Shout back in Carol the day. Blackerby. Carol Blackerby for the win. That's right. That's right. Go Deeks. How can people give you some love, brother? I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. My show, Locked In, will be Prospects, available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. You can find the Auburn writing, auburndaily.com, and the Atlanta Braves writing, bravestoday.com. Yep, you can find my writing at those places as well, auburndaily.com, bravestoday.com, and we will see you tomorrow. This has been Locked On Auburn.